This presentation originally took place on February 12, 2019, at a meeting of the Southwest Ohio DNA Interest Group. During this meeting, we discussed the use of DNA Painter, software developed for chromosomal mapping by Johnny Pearl of the United Kingdom. I hope you enjoy. Each year at Roots Tech, to encourage innovation in genetic genealogy, they always have uh, prize winners and people can bring the software that they've developed. And last year, Johnny Pearl brought his software, which was even more under development then, and he won the grand prize. And he is a UK web-based web developer and family history enthusiast. That's how he describes himself. What amazes me is we know he lives in the UK, but if you get involved in that Facebook group, it's like, is this guy up 24-7? Because he's always checking out what people are posting and answering their questions. So to find the software, you go to, to dnapainter.com. And the first thing he does is try to explain what is chromosome mapping. And in order to use it, you have to register it's no cost. You register, it's simple. And on one of the first pages, it has a definition. I think we need a definition. What is chromosome mapping? And they give an example. The examples I'm going to use tonight do come from GenMatch. You'll see that you can upload from anywhere, and they give you directions on how to do it. But the main examples they use are from GenMatch. He uses an example here where on the ninth chromosome, he has the start and the end location, the number of center organs, and in this case, SNPs, because GEDmatch provides that. But you only need the chromosome start, end, and center organs to paste it in. I had been using this once before when it first came out, and I could create profiles, and in that first line, it said, CHR, so it had the CHR9, C, you know, every chromosome it had CHR. It wouldn't accept it now. Anyone that had that, I had to take it out. It only wants the number in that box. That's it. And then if you watch the tape that the woman put together on how to use Excel, she makes a big point over, do not mess with the formatting. Because he's got a program to accept the formatting just the way it is. So she said, you may think this is a space and you don't need it, but actually in the software, it's a tab and it's reading it that way. So any chromosome you're going to paint doesn't make any difference where it's from. You just need the chromosome, start, and location, number of center organs, and anything else is gravy, and it won't hurt anything if you do that. So he gives this example of someone named Joseph C. Bright, on the ninth chromosome, one of the differences here is that when you do 23andMe or any of the other ones, you do get two lines. They're not maternal and paternal. You don't know ever when you look at these other programs, it mashes them all together. At the maternal side, is it the paternal side? No, it's wherever it wants to put it. So it's not differentiating it. In this software, the top line is going to be paternal. The bottom line is going to be maternal. And if you do not know, it's going to span the top and the bottom, as you'll see in a minute. What it enables you to do is take a segments you share with a known ancestor and map them, as they say, onto a template. That's what chromosome mapping is. Why would I want to map DNA segments to my ancestors? We have a natural desire to discover who our matches are and how we're related to them. When you have a known second cousin, for instance, you have a strong indication that the DNA you share came from your great-grandparents. Unless you are related to your second cousin more than one way, and they bring this up as a caveat because sometimes when you go back that number of generations, there's intermarriages within the family, and you assume, I've got this down, and then later you find out there was another family involved there. But unless you're related to your second cousin in more than one way, then your great-grandparents must have been the source of these segments. 
So what do you need to get started? First of all, of course, you've had to take an autosomal test, which most of us have done. And you have to have taken one that provides segment data. And as we all know, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, or MyHeritage, all of their autosomal tests, you can download the segment data. We also know you can't do that for Ancestry. So if your matches, they're now, I think, with a database of 8 million people. So they're by far the largest database. So most likely the people you're related to are going to be there. But unless you can convince them to transfer their data and upload it to uh, GenMatch, then you can't get segment data from Ancestry. So that's a little bit of a disappointing thing. Within the software, it tells you for each company exactly how to do it. As you can see, when you log in, they've got three categories at the top, profiles, a help section, and tools. Okay, well, the help section provides very specific directions on how to get the match data you need, because the first thing you have to do in order to do this is where do I get that data? So you can see, I highlighted it over here, where do you find the match data? You click on there, and it will tell you exactly what to do. And again, if you're using Ancestry for your matches, they have to transfer to GEDmatch. And we've talked before about GEDmatch Genesis, and for a long time they were moving kits over. Now the whole thing's totally GEDmatch Genesis. So uh, there's really no distinction between the two now. Okay, so the whole thing is creating a new profile, which we will do after this presentation. If you brought your computer, we'll give that a shot. And anybody can create a new profile, and you can have one, and it's free. Not only that, but within the program, he has a profile set up that you can play with. You can click on all the components and add things, subtract things, to see how it actually works. But... In order to do the profile, the first thing you need to do, of course, is find some segment data. And in this example, again, he took a match from GenMatch, where they matched on the first, second, and 21st chromosomes. There's a box here that says, who is this profile for? And you can put any name in there you want. Now, if you watch Blaine's video, he always puts a whole lot of information in there. I thought that was the coolest thing until I had to redo everything five times. <laughs> and you can always come back and add it later. He would put like the kit number, uh, somewhere he would list which company it came from, everything he knew about the relationship. Because you'll see, I think in the next slide, that there's a box where you can fill in any kind of information you want on that match. And as he says, that really helps out because you might forget how you got that match or how they're related to you. Then it says, please select male or female. And if you don't know, it just there's an unknown selection. And like I said, the difference there is it's going to paint that information over both bars, the paternal and maternal. You'll see an example of that. So this is what the template or what they call the blank canvas looks like. This is what you're going to paint things on. And so it says paint a new match. And I'm going to say up here, do you see where it says everything is editable? Click on a segment to see more info. And then there's this carrot here. There's like four different pieces of advice there. So just don't read the first one that comes up. Click through and, and see what it says you can do there. And then, of course, these are the tools. And then all the chromosomes are listed. In this case, for the screen, we've got one to nine. And we'll see what each one of those does as we go along. So, create a profile using the data from two GEDmatch kits. First of all, you select the two kit numbers you want to compare. Then, assuming you started with yourself, go to the one-to-one -one compare tool. You don't want to use one-to-many, because that's going to give you all your ancestors, and that's great, and it's going to give you clues. But once you hone in on somebody that you think you want to paint, then you have to go to the one-to-one -one compare tool. 
you enter your kit number in the top box and then enter the kit number of the cousin you want to compare with. Now, I'm going to come back and emphasize that because one of the things I didn't understand is this is for cousins. This, this turned what I thought about chromosome mapping upside down because for the first time, you don't want close relatives, and I'll show you why. And that was the first thing I did. You know, I've got all these siblings, I painted them all, I painted my aunt, my uncle, my nieces. Start over, and you'll see why in a minute. When you put the two kit numbers you want to use in, you're going to get a result that looks like this, on however many chromosomes you match on. You just highlight those things, copy and paste sort of deal, which is really nice if you're using Jet Match, just highlight it. And now you're ready to paint the segments onto the blank canvas. And believe me, when we try this at the end, it is that easy. So you're gonna think, what well, was hard, because it's that easy. So there's a box that comes up and says, paint a match. You just copy what was on the previous table, paste it in there, and then yeah, that's what you want. So default is seven centimorgans. I'd leave it there. Then you see you've got two choices. You can overlay these segments mm -hmm. or you can save the match now. It's up to you what you want to do. I'll show you what comes up. The overlay is a trial run. Okay, when you do that, up it's going to come. The choices are paternal. As you can see, these particular ones. The top one says paternal. The next one says shared or both, I believe. Nothing in the paternal, maternal. I just put a couple of examples of what, the, what that looks like when it says overlay the segments. That's just sort of a trial run so you can see if it looks right. You don't have to do that at all. If you're sure of it, you can just go ahead and paint them. Let's assume I've done that. I'm happy with the way it looks. I want to save the match now. So when I click on that, up comes a new screen. And this is where you can start filling in a lot of information. For instance, in the top two boxes, it says, I know how I'm connected to this map. Now, the people that get really into using this DNA painter, once they've got all their second, third, and fourth cousin, maybe that they know painted, they go exploring. And they may have no idea how they're related to that person, at which point you can just click the box on the right. And I've done that with a couple of them, as you'll see, just experiment. And sure enough, I could tell that they matched other cousins I had painted. So I'm not completely there yet. You can enter the name of your DNA match. You can enter your ancestor's name or the name of the couple. This is another place I totally misunderstood because I started out painting siblings and uncles. You're supposed to go to the first person that you can tell if they're on your maternal side or your paternal side only. So if I paint my, let's say I paint my brother Tom on there. So Tom has the same parents I have, the same grandparents I have, the same great-grandparents I have, the same great-great-great. So then I get smart and it's like, oh, yeah, don't do siblings. That's stupid. I'll do my niece. Well, guess what? My niece has my brother and his wife. You go back. It's not telling you anything. I had to completely flip how I thought about doing this kind of stuff because in other applications that I've wanted to do, I wanted all the siblings, aunts, and uncles, but in this one, you don't. Now, the other big debate, and if you watch Blaine Bettinger's uh, video on there, he will tell you that he prefers the name of the couple, and I'll show you what that looks like. Other people go, no, no, I want the one person. As Blaine points out, sometimes you can get back to that ancestral couple, and then it's really hard to decide which of that couple. You can also do it both ways within one thing. It's not a problem. I'll, and I'll show you what that looks like. Now the next thing, and I couldn't even get this straight in my mind. It says, is this match on your mother's side of your, or your father's side? Well, for some reason in my mind, if they're through my brother, 
I mean, I kept getting all screwed up about maternal and paternal. How stupid was, was I for that? Because all I have to do is go, well, they're on this side of the family or that side of the family, and I was making a big, huge deal out of it. Don't make that mistake, because <laughs> it's way easier. So you can label the segment either with the name, with the ancestor you got them from, or the ancestral couple. And there's a couple of examples here of what that might look like. So, so far, I, as an example, put up RJ. Um, underneath there, I added some details. RJ is related to me through my great-great-grandparents, Alexander and Elizabeth. She is on my paternal side. The gen match kit number is. And then a nice thing you can do, and you don't have to do this, but down here, you can click and adjust it for how certain you are about that match. Like if you know it's somebody that you've researched, you can say you're certain that it's a close relative or it's a triangulated match, or you can back it down. And if you're playing with it, so you're just guessing, well, the interesting thing is when you start painting them, let's say I'm choosing red as a color for this family. If it's one that I don't feel very certain about, it will paint them what I tell it to paint them, but it'll make it a lighter shade of red. You'll see how that goes too. So that's not a necessity, but that's what it will do if you choose to do it. Okay, now it says enter your ancestor's name or the name of the couple. In this case, I knew that this descendant also shared Alexander and Elizabeth with me. So that's what I put in there. I knew that was on my paternal side. We're talking a woman here, and I would keep wanting to go, wait a minute, is it Elizabeth? Is it Alexander? It's on my father's side of the family. That's all I needed to know, okay? So it's paternal. Then you can pick any color that you want to use in your map for that family. And the nice thing is, I've got a slide coming up that says edit, edit, edit. Boy, were they right about that. Every single thing can be changed. You can change the color, you can change the couple, you can change it to one person. It doesn't make any difference because it's all editable, which is really nice, and you have some great notes in there. So then you repeat the procedure and add additional cousins related to the person listed on the profile. How hard could this be? It's easy until you start trying to do complicated stuff. So, how do you decide who the most recent common ancestor is? Well, do you want to tie your in common segments with an ancestral couple or with one individual ancestor or either one? It's just up to you. This happens to be from Blaine's video that explains it, but he gave this example. So, we've got Bill and Ann here, and we know that Bill and Ann share 250 centum organs, great-grandparents, and that they're second cousins. And I just started using the colors to sort of explain this. We know Bill inherited this purple set of chromosomes from his father, another purple set from his grandfather, and then the next set came from the great-grandparents. I'm not distinguishing which one at this point. <clears throat> and on the other hand, going up the blue side, same thing. Okay, so they, their in common ancestral couple was the great grandparent. So I put some names in there so we can follow this a little bit better. We've got two second cousins, Bill and Ann. Bill got his DNA from Ed, who got it from John, who got it from Mark and Mary. We haven't differentiated which yet. We know with the way this is color coded, we would say Mary in this case. And then we've got Anne going the, the other way. So in our choices here, in this example, Bill could say that he inherited his purple DNA from his grandfather and passed it on to his father and then to Bill. Conversely, Anne could say she inherited her blue DNA segment from her grandmother who passed it on to Anne's mother and then to Anne. Bill, therefore, could say that he got his purple DNA segment from Grandpa John, and Ann could say she got her blue DNA segment from Grandma Gail. 
That's what the way you would list it if you wanted to connect it to one ancestor. Or conversely, both Bill and Anne could identify their common great-grandparents, Mark and Mary, connected to an ancestral couple. So that's the decision you have to make, which way you want to label them. So what I learned the hard way. If your goal is to determine the ancestor from whom you inherited the segment, and that's the whole idea of this, you do not want to map siblings, aunts, and uncles. <coughs> Here's why. Here's an example right out of Johnny Pearl's software. It says, how you map your segments is your choice. Some people like to use the name of an ancestral couple, while others prefer a single ancestor. To take the simplest step, well, first of all, we got a first cousin here. So the common ancestors would be the grandma and the grandpa. We all understand that. But since you have no way of knowing which grandparent they came from, so the furthest single back ancestor you can assign them to is your father. You know, I mean, that's really not exciting. I didn't need this. I could have done it on Jedmatch. Since you inherited one of each chromosome pair from your father, it just doesn't tell you much. I had to get it through my head why I wanted to use cousins. Well, this helped me get it through my head. I mapped myself and my four siblings and put them in a group. Is that helpful? You know, I also want to tell the story the fifth brother we convinced to take an autosomal test. Um, kept saying, I don't want to do this because I know I'm going to find out it's not related to the rest of you. And we had to inform him that unfortunately for him, he was. <laughs> so he has to deal with that. On the other hand, I didn't talk about this much and it'll come up again, but you can, you see this plus here? When you click on a chromosome, it's going to expand it like this. You can see everything that's in there. Well, this isn't helpful. I can see, and in fact, you can choose whether to put names on there or not put names on there. On, off, on, off, it's simple. And you can see that each of us got different segments from our parents on the same one. I did that again. But it's really, really not helpful, like it w as you will see when we get to cousins. So remember that the purpose of chromosome mapping is... If all of the chromosomes painted are of close relatives, you can't assign them to an individual. Children sh share the same ancestral couple, their parents, so you can't assign their shared segments to either father or the mother. I mean, you can, but it's not going to tell you anything. It's best to focus on second cousins and more distant relatives, especially if you know that they're related on the maternal or the paternal side. So I had to get that through my head. All right, so this is right out of Johnny Pearl's software, too. He's trying to give an example where, in this case, again, you know that they're descended from the second great-grandfather and the second great-grandmother. So now, knowing that, you can paint the segments in there, and you can list the name of the great-grandfather and the great-grandmother if you want, or you can back off one generation, and in this case, they know it came from the great-grandmother's side. Now you've got a segment that you can say, that came from my great-grandmother. If it takes you a minute for this to sink in, it took me a week for it to sink in. So, But those examples come right from the software. When you paste the data in, DNA Painter will automatically paint each segment over the correct part of each chromosome. And again, you get to choose your colors. And since this was written by Johnny Pearl, who lives in the UK, colors is always going to be O-U-R-S. Okay? If you know how you're connected, you can label these segments with the name of the ancestor you got them from. For example, say your match is a third cousin. You both descended from your second great-grandparents, Charles and Mary. The furthest back individual you can assign these segments to is their son, John Smith, your great-grandfather. If you know only the approximate relationship, if the location implies this person is related to him by way of a particular grandparent, you can enter the name of the furthest back individual. 
e.g. that grandparent's name. Now this is where, when they kept saying to me, don't worry, you're going to make mistakes, you can add it, add it, add it, it's when you start doing things like this that you'll be doing a lot of editing. Thankfully, they made it easy. So, this is probably the most important little gadget up here. Because when you click on that, you get this drop-down menu. And you can see that you can import data. By the way, if you're a member, if you subscribe, you can mass import data now. He just added that the last few weeks. So in other words, there's people, if you go to the DNA group, they took all their MyHeritage matches. They didn't care who they were. They uploaded the whole darn group. And I even looked to see what some of them looked like. Well, then you still got to go through and try to figure it out. They'll do that. Did you have a question? Yes, if you import data, are you importing it actually to your computer or if you want it somewhere in the cloud? That is a super question. It's all on your computer. So it's not going anywhere else. And that's a really good question. I haven't tried the second one yet. Apparently, 23andMe, you can import ethnicity data from them. You can import maternal and paternal from FTDNA. You can share it. If you listen to Blaine's talk on that, it says be careful who you're sharing it with for exactly your reason. It's housed on your computer. But if I'm working with a cousin and we're working together, we might want to share it or look this over. Does this look right to you? In fact, I'm going to tell you in the DNA Painter Facebook group, a whole lot of them is, okay, this is what I've done. Does this look right? And I'd really have to look that up. But he doesn't keep the data. You can also duplicate it. This is a really good function I found out after many mistakes. Let's say I'm working on a profile and I think this is right, but I want to play by adding two or three other people over here. I can duplicate that profile, give it a different name, like copy of or whatever I want, and I can play with it over there. You can remove duplicate segments, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why this happens, but sometimes I get a result. Same person painted in there twice. I don't even know how it happened, but sometimes that happens, but you can just come back and click on that, and it takes it out. You can download a picture. You can reset the position of the key. I'll show you what the key looks like in a minute. And then it says take a tour of this page, which I haven't done. You also have choices about do you want to show names on the segments and the group overlay by default? That just means you <coughs> list all the names. Um, show centromeres. That's sort of usually a part somewhat in the middle, different spaces on different chromosomes. You can ask it to show those if you want. You can show key lines on expanded chromosomes. In other words, you can even add, as you'll see in a minute, you can, in your key, move all your paternal ones together and your paternal, paternal ones together and put a line between them and things like that. What I really like, and I'll show you this in a minute, where it says all segment data, you can click that. Okay, so these are all my brothers, you know, that I painted, the one I showed you earlier. Well, what's really great about this is chromosome by chromosome now, I've got the start, the end, the number of centimorgans, the group that they're in, and I can save that. And they suggest over and over and over to save your work somewhere. You have a choice up here of setting up a CSV file or backing up a data file and like they say, you don't want to have spent hours on this and not have saved your work somewhere on your computer. But that's the kind of screen you'll get if you choose to do it. All right, so here's what I did. Rebecca, how many did you say? How many chromosomes did you say you had in percentage? 68 segments and what percentage? Oh, uh, 30%. See, she's ahead of the game on me. She's got more. No matches in there than I. Even Blaine says he puts examples of his up on a maternal side and paternal side. And what's really great, let me show you this down here. This is what they call the key. And you see this has a line in, in it that you can assign. On the top, I have paternals. On the bottom, I have maternal. Down here, you can look just at your paternal matches, and it will take the maternal right out. You can do 
the maternal and take it out, you, the paternal, you can do all. But the interesting thing about this is you can see here that the top row are male chromosomes, the bottom are maternal chromosomes, I mean, excuse me, segments, all on chromosome one. Do you see that? And any of the other programs we use don't do that. But how did they know if they were maternal or paternal? It's you tell them. Okay? It's what you tell them. And the other thing is, it's, I'm going to talk about this in, in a little bit too. But you see these hash lines here? Is That's a region that they know is what they call a pile-up region. And that means that within that population, a lot of people tend to share the same segment. And maybe you shouldn't count on them as much as other ones that you've painted, but that's what it means. So this is one I've done, and you can see who I got in there, because this is what I started doing after I started going back and just looking at second cousins and beyond, if I knew. So I just highlighted the key, partly <laughs> because I wanted to show you this. If you see these little grab boxes here, you can literally click on one of those boxes and move it up or down. It doesn't have to stay where it is. So he has a whole section on the legend and kinds of things you can do. You can move the group at the top to the below the third group. You can do whatever you want to do in terms of using those grab bars and just sliding them up and down. And that's listed in the software too. Now these are, I did an example here with my favorite <coughs> great-grandparents, Alexander and Elizabeth, because I have a lot of cousins for that, and just to see what came out. And I put this one up here because I wanted to show you. You also have the opportunity to view the match. You can edit the match. You can edit the segment. This is what I mean about edit, edit, edit. If you find out that you think you did something wrong, or maybe you tied a name to a segment, and it's like, oh, that's not them, it should have been. You'll get a drop-down menu like this, and you can edit anything you want. Again, I said if you click on a chromosome number here, it expands. So here's a couple of examples. Here's the first chromosome. This particular one has, happens to have two segments on the paternal side, nothing on the maternal. If I look at chromosome two, several of them on the paternal side, but nothing on the maternal. Same here with chromosome number three. I just want you to remember that you can click on the chromosome and we'll expand it. And then the other part is where it says show match names. If you click that box, it's going to put it right next to it, um, who it came from. Which is really cool for somebody doing a presentation like this, because you know how for privacy they always want us to take the names off. So all I had to do is click it to make this slide. If I went back in, if this was live, I could just do show the matches. Again, this is a reference to these common pile-up areas. This is on chromosome 2. When they're marked like that, it sort of gives, it tells you even where they got the information that that's a pile-up area. And it takes you back to something on the ISOG. We've talked about the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. The more they study these things, they know there's some areas that tend to, people tend to cluster there. And it may not be someone that you inherited the DNA from, it just may be in that population. So it, that's what that means. You didn't paint them, they're there. So now, what I learned, edit, edit, edit. Because you're not going to get them right, believe me. Okay, so let's say you want to edit the segment. Well, right away, if I, when I pull up that box, we talked about that confidence level you can assign. You can change the notes for the segment to whatever you want. You can delete the segment. You can copy the segment. And you can see it has all my information stored here on the left-hand side. This was an example of an X chromosome that I had that came through on my maternal side. 
So we're going to play with this in a minute, too. Of course, Blaine collaborated with Johnny Pearl on this. And this is the neatest darn thing. You know how we've always looked at those green charts to see, could that be a second cousin or a third cousin based on Centimorgans? He developed this interactive tool, and anybody can get this. If you've noticed, he even put it in uh, the <laughs> commons. So anybody, you don't have to have DNA painter at all to use this tool. So what will happen is you put in the number of shared centimorgans you have with somebody, or you could put in a percent, because I think it's 23 Me likes to report it by percentage, and you can convert it any way you want. And then once you do that, and, and by the way, here's the site. Make sure you've got this written down, okay? At dnapainter.com, tools, shared set of work. We're all familiar with tables like this. One of Blaine's passions has been this project. For years, he's had people voluntarily go through their database, and if you know it's a second cousin, and they have this sent to them. And you can still submit it. He gives you a place to submit it even now. For instance, at the top, let's say that I know 214 centimorgans. Well, if I come down here, I can see what the high and the low range is and what the possibilities <coughs> are. I think we have to emphasize this again, because when I was speaking down in Kentucky on uh, Saturday, there's still people that honestly believe if Ancestry tells them it's a first cousin, it's a first cousin. Mm -hmm. You know, they understand that the same amount of centimorgans fit in the more than one category. So once you hit enter, you all see this one? Look what happens. Only the possibilities are left on the screen. Is that not the coolest thing? <laughs> Along with the range. So if I look at that gray one down here, for instance, where it says great, great niece or nephew, the average is 427, but the range is 191 to 885. And he just didn't arbitrarily, please understand, accept what we submitted to him. They statistically analyzed any, every one of these, and if they were a big kind of outlier, then it was thrown out. So those are the kind of numbers that he's got, and this has pretty much become the Bible. The other thing I want to point out is on that one page under the help page, it says articles and resources. There are many, many articles related to this that you can read and click on. There's Blaine's video here. You click on it, it's a great overview. Also, if you want to do other sites and you have to use Excel and you feel like you don't know how to do it, underneath Blaine's, there's another video that gives you the basics of using Excel to do this. I found that to be extremely valuable. And then it's been mentioned several times since then that more and more as people are using these, you can go to YouTube and click on DNA Painter and see what else is out there. And in fact, just last week, I had found one that I had watched. And as it ended up, Johnny added it to his site in the last two weeks. It's now on the list, too, of things you can look at for resources. So this is what I mean about Excel. If, if you don't know what you're doing, and believe me, I did not know what I was doing because let's say I loaded all my uh, maps on GenMatch over here, but then I wanted to sort them by chromosome and you know do that layered thing that I know Jenny could do in her sleep. At any rate, I needed to review how to use Excel to do those kinds of things, and there's a fantastic video there by Ashley Benz. So, how much does it cost? Well, anybody can play with one of these, and I suggest you do, at no cost. If you really get into this, or you want to use that bulk import tool, you have to become a member. As it says, free members are limited to one profile. They cannot use the bulk import tool. If you want to subscribe, you can do anything on the site that they have up to 50 profiles. And if I show you mine, I've probably got 20 of them right now. When I get finished with something that's no longer of value, it's very simple to delete them. Again, it says how to use the import function. I bet that's only been up there for a month. He just developed that tool. 
It says right in there that you have to be a member to be able to do it. And here's the summary. Except that you will make numerous mistakes. I know you, you might all get it faster than I did, but um, can't get too frustrated over it. Luckily, almost everything is editable. In order to identify a particular segment as coming from one ancestor, trace an individual back to where they are only related to one grandparent, one great-grandparent, etc. And even Blaine says, this is not easy. I think that's why he prefers ancestral couples. That's how he does his. Conversely, you can choose to do a batch import of all of your matches from a company and try to assign segments after the fact. I actually did that after I saw a guy put it up on the group, how he did it. I don't think it's easier to go back and try to figure them all out, but whatever. Join the DNA Painter Facebook group and share your joys and frustrations with others. Remember that this software is still under development and Johnny Pearl often incorporates suggestions. I can't tell you how many times in the couple months I've been following the site that he goes, that's a great idea, and he added, and that's why they call it beta. <laughs> so having said that, I can take a couple questions and then I suggest if you've had enough, thank you for coming on this cold windy night. If you want to try a profile, stay and we'll do it. <laughs>